everyone. I'd like you to picture a leaf. Did it look like this? Probably not, but maybe it was one of these. So I said the word leaf, and you probably all had different images of all these different leaves of different colors and shapes and species. And yet all of that gets called leaf. Why do we generalize like this in language? Well, one of the main functions of language is communication. And communication requires a commonality in order to be understood. And that commonality can look like a shared vocabulary set of mutually agreed upon words. And we know from linguistics that the relationship between word and its meaning is pretty arbitrary most of the time, and we know that because of the variety across languages. The important part is this mutually agreed upon bit. It's like we all sign this unconscious, non-binding contract that when I say leaf, I'm lumping together all of this, and we call it a day because you probably know what I mean. So I got this linguistic metaphor from philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, and he talks about how words are all concepts, and how concepts are formed by making equivalent that which is non-equivalent. And so he's making us aware that when we say the same word, we're not actually talking about the same thing, and that actually language is incapable of capturing the supreme specificity of individual experience. And so that brings me to my next theorist, literary theorist and linguist Roland Barthes, and he talks about this, but he calls it myth. So he says that myths are concepts that naturalize themselves as always having been what they say that they are. And they hide their historical contingency inside of themselves, giving a nice natural and eternal justification. So I've been really interested in this leaf metaphor for a long time. And I think it can apply to labels for gender and sexuality. And that led me to my senior project, where I interviewed 14 people about what labels that they use for gender and sexuality, and then also how they feel about those labels. And for me, the project was about investigating how this small sample of people navigates this intersection between language and identity. And so all sorts of words came up in my interviews, obviously, but I want to focus on a particularly complicated and layered example, which is the word queer. So there's a million and one things to say about queer and its history and its usage, but I want to just give a brief overview. So in its original usage, it meant peculiar, strange, weird, or odd. And in the 19th century, it took on its more derogatory meaning as a slur directed at homosexuals and gender nonconforming people. But by the 80s, it was largely being reclaimed by political activists as an identity marker, as well as entering the academy in the form of queer theory or queer studies, which is largely affiliated with Eve Sedgwick and Judith Butler, for example. But this reclamation wasn't and isn't something easy and pretty and nor should it have been, and it's an ongoing conversation, and it came up in all of my interviews, which I'll come back to later. So we've talked about how we might take words and their meanings for granted, and I want to talk about this in another way. So for my colloquium, I used a metaphor of nouns, adjectives, and verbs to talk about the evolution of queerness and queer identity. And so when I say noun, I'm talking about this factness of identity that comes up when we say things like, I am queer, I have always been queer, or things like, I'm straight, I'm a man, I'm a woman, etc. But this feeling of identity as something internal and stable is something that we might take for granted as natural and obvious. But let's think back to Roland Bacht and what he said about how myths naturalize themselves, right? And so we know that identity has not always been considered in this way. Certain acts may have been queer, perverse, or even illegal, but that didn't make the person who was committing them queer. So I describe this focus on the behavior and the acts as the adjectiveness of queer, where it's confined to descriptors as opposed to an identity category. To help us understand how we get to this point where queerness is identity-based, it's helpful to look at a moment of transition where adjective becomes noun. So historian John D'Amelio helps me understand one of these shifts in his essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity. And he talks about how we moved from considering the homosexual act to the creation of a homosexual species or individual. He connects that shift to capitalism and the rise of industrialization. As people moved into cities and as wage labor spreads and production becomes socialized, then sexuality is released from the imperative to procreate. He looks at how in colonial New England, for example, there were homosexual acts, there's evidence of that, but because survival was centered around participation in a nuclear family, there just wasn't room to be gay as a way of life. And so I briefly want to look at the definition of capitalism, because I think it'll help us understand this. 
And so he talks about how we're free. There are two ways in which we're free under capitalism, right? We're free to sell our labor power, but we're also freed from any other alternative. <laughs> and so with this shift that he looks at, people move into cities and they're free to form their sexual identities and to organize socially and politically around these identities, but they're also freed from the capacity to not align yourself with a sexual identity. So now I want to get into some of the data from my project and talk about how some of my interviewees feel and use the word queer. So Natalie said, I think it's an incredibly complicated word that different people have different relationships to. And I think there's a way to hold space and respect for all of that. So this acknowledgement of complexity and multiplicity is what brings me to my next piece of theory. So in the 80s, cultural anthropologist Gail Rubin writes an essay called Thinking Sex, where she basically calls for an overhaul of all of the ways in which we think about sex and sexuality. And one of the things that she talks about is how in order to have what she calls a pluralistic sexual ethics, we need to develop benign sexual variation. And so variation is everywhere. It's fundamental to all life. And yet when it comes to sex and sexuality, there's one way to do it best, and everybody's got to do it that way. So to help us understand what she means by benign, I think it's helpful to think about the example of food. So we're usually pretty OK with people liking different foods than us and eating different foods than us, and maybe even using different utensils to eat that food. And so Ruben says we need this capacity for benign variation when it comes to sex, sexual behaviors, and sexual identities. And so to bring it back into my data, remember how Natalie said that there was a way to hold space and respect for all of this multiplicity. And so yes, words mean different things to different people, but we can have this benign sexual variation, this capacity for benign sexual variation. A lot of my interviewees talked about queer as something big and expansive. So when Gabrielle talked about how they liked this capacity of queer to be something expansive, they said, are the buttons and pins on a denim jacket homosexual objects? No. But can we call them queer in a more expansive way? Yes. And I think that's a lot of power for that word. And then Christine grew up with being around people using the word queer as a slur and used that as a reason why she didn't feel comfortable personally identifying with it. But she also felt this expansive capacity that I'm talking about. I asked her if she would feel welcome or comfortable at an event or in a space that had queer in the title. And she said, yes, absolutely, because to her, queer is broader. And that she knows if she showed up in that space, no one was going to reject her because of who she was which was in contrast to the story she told me of a lifetime of negative experiences as a bisexual woman. Christine experienced this reclamation process firsthand, but some of my younger participants had things to say as well. So Gabrielle again said, I like that it's a reclaimed word. I think there's a lot of power in reclamation, and I like that it means weird. So here, I love that they're not only enjoying the reclamation from its slur usage, but even further back to its etymological meaning of weird. Bobby <laughs> said that words, at the end of the day, words mean what we want them to mean. Once a word reaches a critical mass of being reclaimed, then it just becomes that word, which is something that is picked up in the field of linguistics, where it's about describing how language is actually used by its speakers, and not about prescribing what words should mean, which gives room for language to evolve as it naturally does. So Natalie doesn't feel that this reclamation is something complete or universal. And they remind us that queer does have a history as a slur, and it's not even a history, it's a present. And it's still happening, and it's very raw and painful for a lot of people. And they talk about hating how people over-apply the word queer, especially when it's used to label someone without their consent. And lastly, Dakota takes us somewhere else. They said, queerness is about another way of being. Not even another way of being, but a parallel way of being. In imagining something else. Critical theorist Jose Esteban Munoz writes about this imagining something else beautifully in his book, Cruising Utopia. And he talks about how queerness is about a rejection of the here and now, which is something that my interviewees talked about a lot when they define their queerness as a negation of cis heteronormativity. But he also writes that queerness is about an insistence on potentiality and a concrete possibility for another world. So even before I had Munoz's words, my work has always been about this imagining other worlds. And I think that's what my interviewees are doing when they create their own relationship to language. And so we've talked about this benign and random world of leaves, and we moved into this niche and complicated land of queer. But I want to end on what I believe to be a fairly relatable and universal word, which is the word friend.
So I invite you to think about what that word means to you. Because I've seen a lot of heartbreak in my life and in the lives of my friends around fundamental misunderstandings about what this word means. Because yes, we all define our words differently, but sometimes we don't know how to communicate these discrepancies to each other. So how might our relationships look different or better perhaps if we figured out how to communicate about this stuff as we're building our friendships? So I can get into the nitty gritty of words and their histories all day long, but really what's at stake here is communication. Because I said earlier that language is all about communication. And so I'm not so much interested in what words we're using, but really in being conscious about how we use them. And so I've talked about these words and how we might take them for granted in the hopes that it might inspire you to reevaluate the words that you're using to describe yourself and then to expand that reflection outwards. Because if we can figure out how to communicate about what words mean to us, then I think we might just be a little bit more, well, you know what I mean.